Howdy folks, this is Bell Geode, this is Microsoft Flight Simulator, and this is a test, otherwise known as one of my chill vids. So, you may immediately notice that we are back on Midway Isle, and Midway is of course my quote-unquote top secret testing facility for testing out new birds, such as this one that we're going to be showcasing today. This is the Nemeth Designs S300 CBI. The 300 CBI is by Schweitzer, and it is a very old platform that has been used as a trainer throughout the world since basically the 1950s. The U.S. Army actually used to use this bird as a trainer for all of their new helicopter pilots. This is, of course, a civilian model, so there is that. But as you can see, it is looking prime time. Now, if Nemeth Designs does sound familiar to you, it should. Nemeth is who made the default Bell 407 that we all got in the 40th anniversary version of Microsoft Flight Simulator. So Nemeth has a very long history with the flight sim. Uh, a lot of their FSX birds were some of my favorites, including their Chinook. So I'm kind of hoping they might uh, take a stab at bringing the Chinook over. Even though we do know that Miltec Simulations is making a Chinook, and I'm really looking forward to that one. But you may ask, why have I decided to choose this helicopter out of all the ones that I've currently got backlogged and intend to make videos for? Well, this helicopter has developed a little bit of drama of late. A lot of people are saying it's difficult to fly and it's not realistic and this, that, and the other thing. And honestly, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. This is Nemeth Designs we're talking about here, and they do know how to make helicopters for the flight sim. So I guess the point of this video is going to be to showcase the helicopter as well as debunk, debunk some of the myths that seem to have popped up around this helicopter. But with that having been said, I will also readily admit this helicopter does have a fair amount of work that needs to be done. And I'm kind of hoping that Nemeth will be watching this video because I intend to point out all the things that I think are areas of opportunity for this helicopter. I'm going to gloss over the immediate one that comes to mind. If you have a co-pilot in here, your co-pilot's arms are dragged all the way to the right as if they're trying to touch the pilot controls. So that's number one. But we'll get that out of the way because we don't have Kara with us. It's just me inside the helicopter. And uh, we should be fine with that. Okay, now as is typical for me with these um, videos, I like to go through the various camera angles. And that's going to bring up another point that I want to discuss. So let's take a look at the external static cams. We're currently in the drone cam. So we'll go ahead and switch over. Okay, so there are four external static cameras that are available in this helicopter, two of which I have changed. This is not one of the ones that I've changed. This is the first static camera, and I actually kind of like this one because you can see all the inner workings of the helicopter. You can see the, uh, the belts, the engine, you know, the fuel tanks, all of that good jazz, and of course the rotor head. And you can see all the detail that uh, Nemeth Designs has put into this bird. So this is a really good view, and I figured I would leave it alone. And then we have the second camera. Second camera is off to the left side, kind of pointing down, but kind of pointing forward, which is really cool if you're doing a lot of cinematic stuff where you're flying low over trees or water and stuff like that. We're going to be using this camera a fair bit in our little flight here today. And then the third camera. Now, the third camera is one of the two that I have altered. Originally, this camera was placed basically on the ground in front of the helicopter facing backwards and up so that you could see the pilot and co-pilot. I'm going to tell you right now, in VR, especially for someone like me who likes to use these external camera shots for cinematic purposes, that's a death sentence. 
if I try to fly while the camera is looking backwards, that's going to end badly really quick. So I figured, let me change this and make it something that I would be more apt to use. A top-down shot, for example, because when we're flying over certain landmarks, or in the case of today's video, we're going to be flying over to the Lexington, which is moored offshore, this way you can get a really good look at what is below you. I wouldn't necessarily use this to land, mind you, but it's good for flyovers. So that's why I've adopted this camera. And finally, the fourth camera. Fourth camera is basically your standard behind the bird. I'm kind of surprised that Nemeth didn't include this type of camera. Now, admittedly, I have raised my point of view a little bit higher because I like to be able to just move my head in VR so I can see what's going on around. I can check for trees and so on and so forth. So that's why I added that in there. Initially, when you first download this bird and install it, the camera is somewhere over there, off to the right of the helicopter, pointing forward. You can't even see the helicopter. All you can see is the scenery around you. Bad idea, Nemeth. Bad idea. So that is why I changed it to this. Now, if you would like, speaking directly to Nemeth Designs, I can forward you the uh, cameras.cfg file that I have modified if you would like to include it in a future update. If not, if one of my viewers is watching this and wondering how you can do that, I can also put either in the video description or in the comments the uh, parameters that I'm using for cameras 3 and 4 if you want to mimic what I'm doing here. All right, but let's go ahead and put it back to this camera because I really like this one. And we're going to go ahead and hop into the cockpit and I have another special message specifically for VR users. Okay, so you will notice we are in the cockpit, and it is every bit a small helicopter, as you can imagine. Now, for VR users, in the cameras.cfg file, typically, you will have two pilot view entries. The very first one, which is camera zero, is for 2D pilots, and typically, the developer will make it so that you can see the gauges as well as see the world around you with enough field of view to handle both. But here's the problem. For VR users, oftentimes when developers do that for 2D, they have the camera pointing this way. Now that's all well and good if you're flying on a monitor, but if you're in VR, what that does is it makes it feel like you're literally tipped forward. Like if the back of your seat was kind of pointed forward, forcing you to be stuck in this position, that's what it looks like. So what they do is typically in cameras.cfg files, the, one of the last entries is going to be the actual VR pilot config. And the VR pilot config is special because it has the initial PBH, which is the orientation of the camera, set to 0, 0, 0. Nemeth Designs did not do this. Now, I don't know if anybody in Nemeth actually has a VR headset, but this is important for us VR users. Please add a VR entry with the initial PBH set to 000. The initial XYZ can be exactly the same as where you have the 2D pilot, but we need to be sitting straight up looking forward. If on the off chance that Nemeth decides not to go down that route, if you are a VR user, you only fly in VR, you can modify your own cameras.cfg file. Just look for the very first entry, camera zero, and change the initial PBH. Wipe out what they have there, which I think is like minus 13, comma, zero, comma, zero. Just make it zero, comma, zero, comma, zero. And that'll give you the proper view that you should have in VR, sitting straight up. All right. All of that out of the way. Other little nitpicky things that I want to mention here. Uh, Nemeth, how come this door doesn't open? Like, I can't find a click spot to open the door at all. Not even on the latch itself. And granted, I know that the uh, Bell 407 also has no way to open the door. But if you think about it, a lot of developers are moving more towards being able to open doors or windows. And especially with this helicopter you can take the doors off. A lot of people fly this kind of helicopter with the doors completely removed. As far as I'm aware, we don't have that option. 
or at least I haven't found it. If I'm incorrect, please correct me in the comments. But with that having been said, I think we've reached the end of my nitpickiness for this helicopter. I'll have other things that I will bring up momentarily, but I want to actually go ahead and get us started here so that way we're not sitting here picking apart and them as work. So, we are going to use a checklist. One thing I will say regarding the manual for this bird, which you have to download from the site, there is not much to it. It's like three pages. It's hardly a manual. It's a general overview. If you would like, you can download the real-life manual for the S300. And I would highly recommend you do that if you're the kind of person who likes to get in-depth with your aircraft. I will leave the link to the PDF that I found in the video description below, so please look for it. That is something that I need to see more developers doing. If not the full real-life manual, then at least give us more information so that we actually know how to fly it. Because I think that is part of what's tying in to a lot of people online lately saying this aircraft is so difficult to operate. It really isn't. But information is key. we got to have that information. Otherwise, you don't really know what to do. And it's funny because when I downloaded the actual PDF for this aircraft, I learned a lot regarding the checklist and how this thing is supposed to operate. I've been flying this thing virtually for years, starting with X-Plane 10 and X-Plane 11. But even I learned some new things that I had not realized when I downloaded the real world manual. And we're going to get into all of that during the startup process. So I'm going to need my checklist. Thankfully, they did put in a full checklist. There are some caveats with that, but I'll go through that as well, because that's what I do. All right, pre-flight inspection. We'll start there. So first things first, we want to make sure all of our switches are off. And we can look down here and see, yes, most certainly we have our lighting switches for the panel, for the position lights or the nav lights, beacon lights off, battery is off, alternators off, governor is off. A lot of versions of this helicopter do not have a governor, so you got to be Johnny on the spot with a throttle to keep your RPMs in the green. However, since we do have a governor, I'm going to go easy mode today, so we're going to be turning the governor on. And then, of course, we've got the fuel boost pump. So everything is off, including all of the various clutch engagement switches there, which I'll talk about later. Throttle closed. Okay, so the throttle, of course, in a helicopter like this is on your collective. And it responds to my pitch controls, my prop pitch controls. But you can see I'm opening and now closing the throttle. It is closed all the way. Perfect. That works. All right, so we can check that off. Bam. Fuel mixture knob, make sure that's at idle cutoff. This is your fuel mixture knob. Should look familiar to anyone who's been in a Cessna. It is currently in the idle cutoff position, which is fine. That's what we want. Fuel shutoff valve, make sure that's closed. When it's pulled out, it is closed. So as you can see, it is very much closed. Collective fold down. Well, I mean, we were just messing with the collective, but if we want, we could lift the collective all the way up and pull the collective all the way back down and you'll see that it is now fully down. Perfect. That's it for this. Pre-start. All right. First things first, we're going to want to get our battery on. So I'm going to go ahead and check mark that and we will go click. So there we go. You can see everything starts coming to life. We do have some caution and warning panels and a nifty little Garmin here, which we might use. We want to make sure our altimeter is set. Now, since I'm using custom weather, as you will have seen in the little commentary that popped up at the beginning of the video, we're already set to 29.92. So there's nothing I need to do to change that. Next, we want to check our fuel quantity. That is this gauge all the way to the left. I've got about a half a tank there. So yeah, we're pretty good. I think around 10 gallons is what I put in there. Obviously, you can't carry a whole heck of a lot with this, and you do need to pay attention to your weight. You do not want this thing too heavy. It's already a very small bird with a very small piston engine, relatively speaking. You don't want to overload it, so keep that in mind. Fuel low warning light off. Uh, well, we can see in the top row here. Yeah, it's definitely off. We can push it to test it. 
There you go, it lights up amber, which is what it's supposed to do. Take that off. Transmission temperature and pressure warning light is currently on. That's this one right here, and you can see it is currently on. Transmission chip light, that is this one here, and we can push it. Lights up amber, which is fine. Rotor low RPM warning light, make sure it is off. And uh, it's actually on. And I believe the reason why it's on is because right now we have zero RPM. So I would say that counts as low RPM. We can, however, push this and that will just light everything up just to test it for us. So there we go. All right, clutch control, auto hold. That is this big bad boy here. And we're gonna be using this one a lot during the startup. And I will explain that momentarily. Down position is auto hold. Up position is to engage the clutch. In this helicopter, how it works is you start the engine first and then you engage the rotor blades. And once everything lines up and superimposes upon itself, then you can start increasing the power using the throttle to flight idle. All right, auto engage switch, make sure it's off. This is your auto engage switch. It's currently set to slow, so the clutch engagement will take a little bit of a while to do. We want it in the off position, which is all the way at the bottom. You'll notice a green light to the right turns itself off, which happens to be the next thing on our checklist. Clutch disengagement light, make sure that's on. That's this red light over by the clutch uh, switch there. So that is on, we are good to go. And that's it for that page. Next, engine start. All right, so we need to first add fuel. So we're gonna turn the fuel shutoff valve on. There it is, it is open. And the throttle, we're gonna wanna open it a little bit and I'm actually going to go through the next few of these all at once and then we will show how that is done. So throttle we're going to want to open, fuel boost switch we're going to turn on, fuel mixture we're going to put to rich, check the fuel pressure, fuel mixture knob back to idle and finally turn the fuel boost switch off. Okay you can remember that right because I'm not sure that I can. Let's start with the throttle. So what I typically do is I will open it all the way, close it all the way, and then roll it about an eighth of an inch thereabouts. Hopefully you can see that. All right, now we're ready for the fuel boost switch, which is this one on the right. And once we get that turned on, we're gonna push the mixture knob all the way in, hold it for three seconds, push it back out and turn off the boost pump. So here we go. We're watching this middle gauge, by the way, fuel pressure. So boost switch on. Let's get our mixture in. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. And we'll pull that back out and turn that off. So there we go, look at that. We've got fuel in the system. Very nice, very nice. Next, magneto key. We want to set it to both. So this is our magneto here. So we're going to go right, left, both. Okay, that is done. And now we actually have to start the engine. So typically it's going to be similar to your average Cessna. You start the engine and you push the mixture knob in. And then we're going to want to set the RPMs around 1400, which we will do with the throttle. So I'm gonna check this and this, and let's go ahead and get her started. The starter switch, by the way, is on the very end of the collective, so we just push that in, push our mixture in, and you can see our RPM's currently set to 600. So I'm gonna raise the throttle a little here. We're trying to get it up to 1400. I have noticed that this is pretty sensitive as far as controls go. We're going to want it closer to 1500 anyway for uh, the rotor engagement. We don't want it to go past that little red mark. So right about there should be good. And we can check to make sure that the transmission temperature pressure light is off, which it does look like it is. It is off. Fuel boost switch, we're gonna to wanna to turn that on now. 
and we will keep that on for the duration of the flight. Oil pressure, make sure we've got a minimum of 25 and our oil pressure is right here. Yes, we are in the green, very nice. We'll also want to turn on our alternator switch, which is conveniently located right next to the battery switch. You can see we're starting to draw a lot of amps. I haven't even turned my lights on yet, so you know what? Let's go ahead and do that. Let's get our beacon lights on, and let's get our nav lights on. And we can also turn on the panel lights if we want to. And here's a little dimmer knob for the panel lights, so we'll set that to full. Perfect. Very nice, very nice. Okay, so we are stable at uh, 1500 RPMs. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky. Let's make sure the collective is down, keep the engine there. All right, now we're gonna be engaging the clutch in order to get the rotors going. If you have a rotor brake control, make sure your rotor brake control is turned off. You will not be able to get the rotors moving if your rotor brake is on. I say that from a point of experience. Yes, I was a dummy. I totally forgot my rotor brake was on. Here's how this thing works. So in order to engage the rotors, this is the rotor needle here. We are going to set our auto engagement to either slow or fast. Typically we do slow. So you'll notice a green light is on. And then we're gonna use the clutch engage switch and we're gonna flip it back and forth between engage and hold. The reason why we're going to do that is because what we will notice is the engine RPM should dip roughly about one or 200 RPM. As soon as it starts dipping, we want to turn off the engagement and slowly but surely we're going to get the rotor up to speed. So we'll keep turning it back on and turning it back off until everything syncs up. This is where I think there may be a problem in how Nemeth has developed this helicopter. What I just described is how it works in real life. And bear in mind, I am not a real life helicopter pilot, but I know a few people that actually have flown this thing or currently do fly this thing. And they all say the same thing. As far as the engagement switch, it's not something that you just flip on and forget it. You always got to toggle it back and forth. But let's see what happens when we actually do that with the Nemeth bird here. I'm just going to go ahead and do all of that. So this is where we are on the checklist. All right. I hope you're ready, folks. This is going to get interesting. So first we engage a switch. Check the RPM. When it starts dropping, we want to disengage the switch. You'll notice the rotor is moving. You can see the shadows. We want to make sure that our RPM stays around 1500 as we're doing this but it really should not be dropping that much that quickly. That seems a little bit problematic to me. And Nemeth, if you could, we need uh, some kind of key bind for this. I would rather have it on one of my verbal switches so that I can flick it with the physical switch rather than having to do this and wait for it to come back up and then do it again. But again, minor complaints, minor complaints. So yeah, it's gonna take us a little while to get the rotors up to where they need to be, which is a little bit unfortunate, but you know, it is what it is. Now we could try doing the fast engagement, however, I'm not 100% certain that that's not going to wreck the clutch. I don't know if uh, that sort of thing is modeled with this helicopter, but we can try it anyway. We'll wait for it to go up. This is going to take a while, folks, and it's really not supposed to take this long, unfortunately. So, Nemeth, you may want to take a look at that. So I'll remind you, this is our rotor RPM needle and this is our engine RPM needle. We really want to keep the engine RPM needle up here, which is why we are flipping this on and off. The best analogy I can think of, remember when we were kids and we used to have the merry-go-rounds 
on the playgrounds and in order to get it go faster because your friends are always like faster faster you kind of grab the pole and just spin it around while they're on it that's basically what we're doing here we're waiting for the pole to come around and then we're flipping the switch which will spin it and we're trying to get it faster and faster it being the rotors It doesn't seem to be getting much faster with us at a fast uh, clutch engage mode, so let's put it back to slow. And we're just going to keep flipping it back and forth, just like that. It is a little bit of a pain in the butt to have to do this with the mouse as opposed to a switch. So Nemeth, like I said, if you could find a way to bind this to a switch for us. That would be awesome. But slowly but surely, you can see that the needles are in fact coming up. So we just got to wait for everything to get up to speed here. This is probably going to be the longest part of the video, simply because it's not exactly doing what I would expect it to. So if you're wondering how realistic this is, this part, mm, I'm not 100% sure it's that realistic. But this is what you are supposed to do. If anyone in the audience has experience with this helicopter, feel free to chime in. Correct me if I'm doing things wrong, because it might just be user error and not actually Nemeth's problem at all. But I'm inclined to think that uh, this is not engaging the way that it should. It is getting there. It's just getting there a lot slower than I would like. Now, the one thing I believe you don't want to do is you don't want to change your throttle settings. We can if we want to cheat a little bit, but that is definitely not realistic. And I'm pretty sure if you did that in real life, you'd probably wreck your helicopter. But it is something that we could certainly consider at some point in time. Alright, so let me increase our throttle just a nubbin. There we go. Go ahead and get that. You can see it's coming up. It's just coming up slowly. We're just spinning the merry-go-round to make it go faster. Since this is, of course, a chill vid, I will not be editing any of this out because I do want for Nemeth to see what we're going through here. We're doing it the right way. It's just taking forever. All the real-world videos that I've seen of people starting this thing, it really doesn't take this long for you to, like, toggle the switch back and forth to get the rotors up to speed. And I did make sure that my um, rotor brake is, in fact, off. So I know that's not the problem here. But we will get there. We will most definitely get there. Go ahead and turn that off. Wait for it to pop back up. Get that back up to 15. There we go. So you can see that it's pretty much synced up right there, but that's not where it should be. But if we want, we can kind of cheat a little bit here because I know this is taking a while. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and engage it one more time. And we'll start increasing the throttle. You'll notice our manifold pressure is going up. Everything else is coming up too. Slowly but surely. Clutch disengage, wait for it to separate. And we'll do it again.
Come on. See, now that's way too high. We definitely don't want it to be that high. That could cause some serious problems with the clutch and everything. But that's because we messed with the throttle. Now, the other thing you're going to notice, which is definitely a complaint that I have with this helicopter, is the way that the audio increases and decreases. I don't think that Nemeth actually used a real-world bird to source the sounds from. That is a little unfortunate, because right now, as it stands, the sounds are a bit too quiet, bearing in mind that I have turned down my... Um, audio so you can hear my voice but by the same token something just doesn't sound right on this it doesn't sound as realistic as I think it should all right here we go we're almost there let's go ahead and disengage the clutch wait for that separation you can see the rotors are definitely moving faster now, so it's getting there. It's just taking us forever to get there. I just want it to get up to the green. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. And slowly but surely, it is getting in there. Let's do it one more time. So we'll disengage the clutch. Still rising, which is fine. But we're waiting for that needle separation. Any minute now. And hovering over the switch. There's a separation. Okay. And that should, in theory, bring us up to where we need to be. So what I will do at this point in time is I'll go ahead and close the uh, latch to make sure that our clutch stays engaged. And at this point, I'm actually going to start increasing our RPM because we need to be set to about 2600 RPM. Now, since we have the governor, once we get to 2600 RPM, we are going to go ahead and engage the governor switch, which I will remind you is right here. Real world operations, if you don't have a governor, like I said, you got to be Johnny on the spot with the, um, the throttle on the collective handle here. Because you'll need to adjust up or down depending on what your rotor RPM and your engine RPMs are doing. One thing you do not want to see is you do not want to see needle separation once you actually get it up to this green line right here. So we're looking for this center mark, 2600. Right about there should be good. Just waiting for everything to come up, and I'm slowly but surely increasing throttle, as is evidenced by the manifold pressure rating there. Once we kick in the governor, uh, the manifold pressure will change. Now, I'm not 100% sure that's correct. I was talking about this helicopter with Sergio from helisimmer.com. And he believes there may be something up with how the governor is working as well. But what we haven't determined is whether or not that is a Nemeth thing or a Microsoft Flight Simulator thing, which would be an Asobo problem. But either way, our uh, throttle should be almost full. And there we go. We're at 2600, so we'll go ahead and engage the governor. And you see the manifold pressure drops immensely. But pretty much it will keep us there. Now, the only flip side to that is normally when you're doing a startup, you're going to do a uh, needles check. So basically, you're going to turn the throttle all the way down to make sure that the needles do, in fact, split. With the governor on, it's going to prevent that from happening. But we'll quickly go through the rest of the checklist because we're almost done here and then we'll get flying because I know that's what you all came here for. You want to see is it really easy to fly? Or is it the pain in the butt that people online seem to make it out to be? We'll answer that question momentarily. So, engine oil temperature. Make sure it is above 75 Fahrenheit. Oil temp. Yep, looks good. It's in the green. That's all that matters for me. Engine oil pressure between 35 and 95 PSI. Uh, right there. It's in the green. It's 
smack dab in the center. I'm okay with that. All the lights are off, 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 and off. Cylinder head temperature, which is over here. Make sure it's below 520 uh, Fahrenheit. It certainly is. It's in the green. Ammeter. We'll go ahead and check that. And yes, we are drawing quite a great deal of amps. So we're good to go. And that is it. The rest is all hovering, takeoff, landing, which usually I don't do those checklists because I like to do my own thing. But let's take a moment here and set up our avionics really quick. So we want the map here on a little Garmin. And we're not going to do a whole heck of a lot today. We're actually just going to fly out to the Lexington and then we're going to land on the Lexington. I will remind you, USS Lexington is brought to us by Miltech Simulations. It's the same one I had in the last video. It should be a lot easier to land on, though, considering we're in a helicopter. All right, but everything looks good to go except for my landing lights, which is right there on the cyclic. Hopefully you can see that. But yes, landing lights are on. All right, so we are ready for a hover taxi and takeoff. My plan is, since we have no wind today, we'll probably hover taxi to the taxiway, which is just before those red and white drums you're seeing over there. And we'll probably uh, take off from the hover taxiway. We don't necessarily need to go all the way to the runway. But before we do that, let's quickly go to the outside view and make sure that everything looks kosher with all our lights and all that. All right, before we get started, let me take a sip of water. Hopefully you didn't hear that. That was actually more of a gulp of water. Okay, so to fly this thing, I'm going to tell you straight off the bat, do not ham fist it. Especially if you've got a uh, real helicopter controls in your flight sim setup, or even if you've got like a Verpal Holtas system like I do. Fingertip movements. You may have noticed that's what I named this video. Fingertip movements. This thing is so easy to overpilot and overcorrect. That's where a lot of you all are running into problems is you're trying to fly it more like a Cessna. You barely move these controls in order to get this helicopter to do what you want. Remember it is very light and it is relatively very underpowered. I say it like that because it does have enough power for us to do what we want to do. But if you load this thing up on fuel and people and cargo and whatnot, you're not going to get anywhere fast. All right, but let's go ahead and start raising the collective. Probably about 40% collective. We're going to start getting light on the skids. And I'm going to want to feel around to figure out what this helicopter wants to do. And then we'll adjust accordingly. So right about now, it looks like we want to lean a little to the right. We're going to add a little bit of left pedal here and try to keep her stable. When you hover taxi in this thing, they say you should be around three or so feet. Gauging that is made easier if you are in VR. I don't know how you 2D monitor guys do it, but um, yeah, there is that. But as you can see, well, you can't see my controls. One of these days I'll actually set up my webcam so that you can do that. But I am barely putting in any control inputs at all. Slight movements. I'm not kidding, folks. Fingertip movements. There's a reason why helicopter pilots always say that. It takes very little to get this thing to go where you want it to go. I imagine three feet is probably a little bit higher than this uh, taxi light here so we'll go ahead and get a little bit more collective here there we go now I do have some slight left pedal in so I'm going to want to take that out 
since we're starting to weather vane, we're getting fast enough to where she just wants to point in the direction of uh, the winds coming. So you can see, aside from the wobbliness, which we can chalk up to just me being rusty, having taken my hiatus, it's really not that difficult to fly. It's a trainer, folks. It's not rocket science. This thing should not be difficult for you to fly. Now, I will also caveat that to say I'm sure the Xbox guys are probably having the worst time with this helicopter, but then you're on an Xbox. Fingertip movements on a D-pad just quite ain't going to cut it, if you know what I'm trying to say here. So hopefully, and I believe Nemeth has acknowledged this, they will be putting in more assistance settings for those pilots. Which is not to invalidate you, because honestly, even if you're on an Xbox, yeah, you could have a lot of fun flying this thing, and I would hope that you do. But just remember, this is not your daddy's high-performance group H145. There is no SAS, stability augmentation. There is no autopilot. There is none of the little creature comforts that most of you have come to expect to keep your helicopters flying straight and level and smooth. This is the old school. You've got to work for it. It's a lot of exercise. That's all I will say. All right. But since we are at the runway, we're just doing a quick check for traffic. I don't see anybody in there. No one I know. And we are going to hang a left and basically do a circuit around the island. So I'm going to give it a little bit more collective and a little bit of left pedal. We'll also give it a little bit of left cyclic. Do not forget, you do have rotor trim controls. Those do work, so you can trim your rotor blades forward, which will tip your nose down like it's doing right now. Add a little bit more collective to compensate. Watch your vertical speed. Typically, you don't want to get any lower than about five or 600 feet per minute. Otherwise, that dreaded VRS might rear its ugly head. Well, you probably have to get past like 1,000 or 1,500 for that. But yes, you can get into that if you're not paying attention. Remember, the point of flying a helicopter is not to model vortex ring state. It's to not get into vortex ring state. Keep that in mind, please. It seems to come up a lot. People are like, well, does it have VRS? It does, but that's kind of not the point. The point is to not get into VRS. I'm just saying. All right, but I've yacked on enough, so let me go ahead and ease the pressure on the pedals. We're going to make a left-hand turn, and I'm going to go to the outside view. All right, so I wanted to do an out of ground effect hover here just to kind of show you that it is pretty stable once you get the hang of it. Like any helicopter, they are by nature unstable. 
but it's up to you to do the work to make it do what you want. And it's easy enough to do as long as you remember that cardinal rule, fingertip movements. As far as the collective, I always uh, keep the corner of my eye on the vertical speed indicator there on the far right, just below the altimeter. And that gives me an idea if I'm gonna need more or less collective. And as far as the cyclic, it's really just a feel thing and it's gonna depend greatly on your controls. And holy crap, look at that. Sorry, I just got sidetracked here. There is a destroyed building or damaged building in my scenery. That was never there before. Okay, hold on, folks. We're going to need to hit the deck here. So I'm going to chop the collective a bit, point the nose down. Yeah, I know. This is kind of risky, but the governor is on, so we don't have to worry about overspeeding the rotors or the engine. Drop the collective a little here. And trim our rotor blades. I want to check out this building. I really do. Our speed's dropping like a rock here. But yeah, look at that. Look at that. See, folks, this is what I'm talking about when I say that Microsoft Flight Simulator is evolving. Aside from the obvious caveat that we will soon have the Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024 in I guess another year or so. But yeah, this is stuff that I've never seen before. Typically, the AI will make, you know, the usual fake buildings like those green roofed buildings just in front of this broken one here, or the one with the gabled roof there, or the one that looks like it's got AC units on top, or maybe that's construction. I'm not 100% sure. But either way, this is typically what you would see in the sim. But this, let me, uh, let me pirouette my way around here. Look at this. I have never seen this before in the flight sim. I have never seen an actual destroyed building. This looks like maybe they had a fire or an explosion or just some kind of catastrophic, catastrophic failure that resulted in this. This is nuts. Look at that. I've said it before, I'll say it again. We are in the golden age of flight simming. Look at the detail on that. That's not something you see every day, so I'm kind of glad that it caught my eye and I could at least show it to you. That's pretty neat. Let's look from the outside and then we'll head over to the World War II island as I call it. I forget the exact name. I'll have, probably have it pop up right now or a little bit later. I love it. You cannot tell me this helicopter is difficult to fly. This is just perfect. Here we are skimming the waters at about 20 feet off the deck. 
and for the most part pretty stable. Of course it's me we're talking about here and like I said I'm still pretty rusty. But I mean look at your screen. Does it look like this thing is really difficult to keep going straight? Absolutely not. It is not difficult at all. Now one thing I do wish that Nemeth would add, perhaps in a future update, I kind of like the float version. I remember in the X-Plane version that I had, which was by Dreamfoil Creations, I remember that particular version had the option of floats that you could put on this thing. And granted, floats do increase drag and whatnot, but we're talking about a helicopter where you're not going to fly any faster than about 100 knots. Typically, 90 is your upper limit for that. But I would love to have floats on this thing because I also love landing on the water, especially in a helicopter. It's cool. It's fun. All the cool kids are doing it. So Nemeth, if you're looking for things to do to increase the longevity of this product, definitely add a float version to it. Now I feel like we probably could try some confined area landings, but um, this video is starting to drag on enough already. So we'll just kind of check out the old airfield here that is in disuse. And then we're going to head over to the Lexington and that's where we're going to call the video for today. I'm giving her a little bit of right pedal, very little right pedal because she wants to go right to begin with. It's just the way this helicopter is. And you can see off in the distance there is the Lexington. So we're going to head over there and... Uh, I guess we'll do another Case 1 carrier approach. I'm kidding, we don't do Case 1 carrier approaches in helicopters, especially something like this. But, we're going to attempt to. We're going to try it. Why not? Alright, so let's uh, give her a little bit more collective. And I'm also adding that uh, longitudinal trim, so I'm trimming the rotor blades down forward and that'll ease the pressure on the stick, which will of course help you with those fingertip movements. So yeah, overall, I really enjoy this helicopter. I think Nemeth has done it justice. There are just those things that I've mentioned before that I think are huge areas of opportunity. Probably the biggest area of opportunity are the sounds. The audio on this thing, it, it's just not doing it for me, Nemeth. I'm sorry. And I say that after coming from the Flying Iron Simulations Hellcat which has absolutely amazing audio, but even the default Bell 407, that audio is sublime compared to something like this, which, yeah, I realize the helicopter in real life sounds anywhere between a lawnmower engine and a Caterpillar bulldozer, but it really doesn't sound like this. So, Here's hoping that you can do something about that, Nemeth. Um, I hate to hate to criticize, but I'm hoping that it's at least taken as constructive criticism because I have nothing but good things to say overall about the helicopters that Nemeth has made over the years. And this one is easily one of my favorites already. But of course, I'm pretty biased because I've always loved this particular helicopter. But yeah, I intend to be flying this thing an awful lot, so I can't wait to see what upgrades are coming. And Nemeth, don't forget to let me know if you want me to send those uh, camera.cfg files to you. So that way we can get better external camera views. And of course, fix your VR 
pilot seating issue. Speaking of camera views, okay, so we're gonna start our mock case one approach here. First things first, I am going to take off all the trim settings that I had. So I'm hitting rotor trim reset. And you'll notice the nose pops up as well as we pop up. And there is Lady Lex, the Lexington. All right, so we wanna push ourselves forward here. And you know what, let's go to that external camera view that I created so that way we can get a top-down view of this aircraft carrier. Not gonna lie, folks, it is extremely difficult to try and fly this bird from the outside when you're looking straight down. So apologies if that did not work out exactly as I had originally intended, but hopefully you get the idea. It's a lot easier when you have aircraft that has autopilot because then you can just pop on your autopilot and just go to the top down view. But since that is not an option with this bird, we're gonna go ahead and uh, do our downwind leg and we'll go ahead and come in and that'll do it for the video so overall impressions I really love this bird and all of you out there who are saying it is just so ridiculously difficult to fly you need to work on your skills I hate to be that guy but I'm gonna be like get good fingertip movements I've been saying it the entire video and I mean it you just need fingertip movements to control this bird I'd be willing to bet a lot of you are trying to over control or over pilot this thing if you start yanking the controls like I am deliberately doing right now yeah you're gonna go all over creation and that's gonna make your life a living hell fingertip movements I can't stress it enough all right, but it looks like we are at three quarter of the mile, so we're gonna call the ball. Um, I don't even know what our tail number would be. I guess we can go with three zero zero. Uh, Schweitzer ball. Fuel state is, I don't know, nine, <laughs> nine gallons. <laughs> totally not the way we would do it, but hey. I'm having fun here, and let me tell you, this thing's a lot easier to land on a carrier than either a Hellcat or a Corsair. Let's go to the outside view really quick. All right, right about there is looking good. So we'll go ahead and bring her in. And again, fingertip movements, barely giving it a little bit of right pedal just to point us in the right direction. You can see our airspeed is below 20 knots right now. Which is where we wanna be. And we're just gonna pull back slightly. We wanna make sure that we try to land this thing as level as possible. So I'm giving it a little bit more collective. Try to swing out a little to the left, and we'll plop her down right there. 
Okay, so it was not perfect, but it is still inside the elevator markings here, so I'll take it. I will take it. And that is all I've got for show and tell today. So, thank you as always for watching. This has been Bell Geode. I've been flying in Microsoft Flight Simulator World Update 13, Oceania or Oceania Update. And the aircraft that we have been showcasing today has been the Nemeth Designs rendition of the Schweitzer S300 CVI. One of my personal favorite helicopters that I think Nemeth did do justice, but does have some big areas of opportunity that I would like to see them explore. The links to everything is in the video description below. I'll remind you that the aircraft carrier that we're on is by Miltech Simulations. This is the USS Lexington CV-2, and that is also linked in the video description below. If you enjoy what you've seen, please feel free to give me a like, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so. When next we return, we're probably going to do some more helicopters. I have a few helicopters backlogged that I would like to show you, so that is going to be on the agenda. I should clarify that, a few good helicopters. I will not be showing the ones that I consider not good. If you know, you know. And that's all I will say about that. But yes, when next we return, we'll have a different helicopter. We'll probably still be here on Midway because I'm enjoying the heck out of this. But eventually we'll start exploring other parts of the world again as we did before. But I kind of want to keep everything on the same baseline for the time being just so I can get some really good tests in whenever I get around to doing the recording. But that's enough for me, so thank you again for watching, and I will talk to you all really soon. Belgeode, signing out. Ciao!